Hello, Prof. Joe here. Today we're going to talk about uh, absolute motion analysis uh, for rigid body kinematics. And this is part of our introduction to rigid body kinematics, where we're kind of taking off the training wheels and we're going away from our particle assumption, where we had no rotation, into rigid body kinematics, where we have full bodies and those bodies can rotate. Uh, in this section, we're actually going to tie two things in that you've already learned about. Uh, you, in particle kinematics, you already did dependent motion problems. You remember the pulleys where one particle was moving, you had to figure out the speed of the other one. Uh, you've also done rotation about a fixed axis. That's how does an object, how can we relate the linear to the angular velocity of an object that's spinning? We're going to squish those two things together. And this may also remind you of frames and machines from statics where you had to analyze a system and how forces flew th flowed through different components of that machine. Uh, we're doing a very similar thing here, but we're looking at just how it moves, not the forces. We'll do forces later in kinetics. Uh, there are a lot of mechanisms in engineering where you need to relate rotational motion to linear motion. And that, this will be very handy for that. An example would be uh, if you have an internal combustion engine in your car, you have a piston that goes up and down, that's linear motion. You have a crankshaft that spins, that's rotational motion. And there's a relationship between those two, and we're going to be doing an example problem that shows how you might be able to solve that. So let's go ahead and get started. So what you see here is a window, and that window has this silver piece is called a linear actuator. And that linear actuator just gets longer and shorter. But you can see as this one gets longer, it's making the window open. The window is rotating as it opens. Uh, let's say you were a designer, and you were trying to choose which linear actuator to put in the window. You knew how fast you wanted the window to open, or the speed of, of the angular rotation that you were looking for. But you needed to know, what linear actuator do I buy? OK, well, I, I, let's go ahead and make up a problem for this one where we can relate those two things. The first step, as always, is to draw a picture. So let's see if I can draw this thing. We have a window. And then we have a linear actuator. It looks like it's almost near the hinge at the top. I'm going to make it a little bit further down just so I can have some dimensions on my picture. And this is our linear actuator. And we need some distances. Let's say this is 2 feet, 24 inches. Uh, and let's say this is 5 inches apart. So the distance between the hinge of the window and where the linear actuator attaches is 5 inches. Total window is 24 inches. And now we need, just like we did in dependent motion with particles, we need some reference points. We call them datums. Uh, the first reference point I'm going to put up is a reference point for how long the actuator is. That one's actually going to rotate as the actuator rotates. It's in a fixed position, and it's going to be this distance, s, that linear distance of how the linear actuator uh, increases. And then we need another one, which is how, how much is the window open? If theta, which is going to be our angle we use, is 0, the window's closed. As it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the window's more and more open. Our theta is going to be relative to this vertical datum. And we're going to have this s theta. OK, so we have on our drawing now an s and a theta. And we're going to use geometry to tie those two together. OK, you might want to quickly jump into sine or cosine. But do we have any right angles on our triangle here? The answer is no. And the angles are changing all the time. So how would we relate a triangle that doesn't have any right angles but has changing angles all the time? Hopefully, cosine or sine law jumped right to your head. And we, that's what we'll be using. Here's a little reminder, in case you uh, don't have those handy. Um, we're going to use the cosine law. As you can see, the capital C is opposite lowercase c. And that's the angle that we need in the cosine law. In our drawing, s is opposite theta. So our s is going to be our c. That means we can write this out as c squared, which is our s equals the other two sides squared, 24 inches squared, uh, plus 5 inches squared, minus 2 times 24 inches times 5 inches times the cosine of that opposite 
angle, which is theta. And we have a relationship. Now this is a relationship between the length of our linear actuator and theta, which is really what we were looking for. But now you're the designer, and you want to know, well, what velocity do I need in my linear actuator to make a, a known omega? Well, we now need a v and an omega. How are we going to do that? Well, we take the derivative, and we use our base kinematic equation. Uh, before we do that, we want to clean this up a little bit. Um, so we'll just say, do a little bit of math. s squared is equal to uh, 576 plus 25 minus 240 cosine theta. I believe that's 601. 601 minus 240 cosine theta. Okay, And now we want s by itself, so we can take its derivative. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and take the square root. s is equal to square root of 601 minus 240 cosine theta. OK, I just gave myself a little bit more room. This is the same equation we left off on, 601 minus 240 cosine theta. And now we're going to take the derivative. Uh, we know that um, velocity is going to be equal to ds dt, our base kinematic equation. Now, if you notice, there's no t in our equation. So we're going to have to use uh, the chain rule. Let's just write it, the chain rule right here to remind ourselves. Uh, the way I like to do the chain rule is I know I have a ds dt, so I'm going to do a ds here. I'm going to do a dt over here. And then I have to fill in the middle based off what's in my equation. In this case, it's a theta, d theta, and a d theta. Those two multiplied together is going to give me ds dt. Now, ds d theta, we can take by taking the derivative of this, just going to be equal to uh, bring the 1 half power down, everything under the radical. And then we have to take the derivative uh, inside of that. Let me just give myself a little bit of room here. And the derivative of this, of course, the 601 goes away. Uh, derivative of cosine is negative sine, so we get 240 sine theta. Everything I've written so far is ds d theta. And then, of course, I have to do d theta dt in order to get the full. OK, so now I have an equation with v in it. And I have a d theta dt. What's d theta dt? Well, we know one of our uh, base kinematic equations for rotation is omega equals d theta dt. So what's d theta dt? It's omega. And we can plug that in. So we're just going to plug it in and clean a few things up. And we get velocity is equal to, uh, I forgot my negative 1 half. Oops. We brought down the 1 half power. And then, of course, we subtract 1 from the power. We need the negative 1 half. So v would be equal to, we got a 240 on the top, a 2 on the bottom, 120 sine theta um, times omega. all over the square root of 601 minus 240 cosine theta. OK, we've reached our goal. If we know it for any given theta and any given omega, we can determine how fast our linear actuator has to move to get the window to operate in that. Um, to get the window to operate with that given omega. Uh, if we had thetas and omegas, we'd plug them in, and we'd have how fast the linear actuator is going. If we knew how fast the linear actuator was going and we had a theta, we could solve for omega, the angular velocity of the window. Let's move on to another example problem. OK, for our next example problem, we do have a crankshaft. You can see we have a piston, and that piston will be moving back and forth in a linear direction. And that piston has a couple linkages, and it's going to uh, be directly related to uh, both theta and omega of those linkages. I'm going to go ahead and make a drawing of this, and then we can go through and solve it. OK, I got a drawing that looks something uh, like the linkage down there. And now we need to set up our datum. So we need to figure out where are our reference points. Um, we have a linear motion. This is going to be going back and forth linearly. So we need a linear datum. I'm going to put one right here. 
I'm just going to say that the distance from this datum to uh, my piston is s. Okay. And then the other one that we need as well, we're going to have a theta and an omega. And I'm just going to have that to a horizontal. So from horizontal, how's that theta and omega uh, going to be changing? Um, so now we have some geometry that we can use to relate um, s to theta and omega. How are we going to do that? Well, um, what we need to do is we need to make some triangles. OK, I'm going to go ahead and cut this in half and say I have uh, S1, which is going to go from here to here. And then I have an S2, and it's going to go from there to there. This way, I can break up the problem, and I can look at those individually. Then add them back together, say s1 plus s2 equals s, and I'll have the full equation. Um, s1, we do have a right angle. Luckily, we're right here. We've got a right angle. So we have a right triangle, and we can use sine and cosine. Uh, I think you can see here, if we said the cosine of theta, we would end up with uh, s1 over 0 0.2. And let's see, what is this in feet? 0 0.2 feet. And if we go ahead and solve for uh, S1, we end up with S1 is equal to 0 0.2 cosine theta. OK, for S2, we could do something similar. We could continue this out, and we could say, well, we have an angle over here. We call that theta 2. But then we're introducing another angle into our um, equation. And then we'd have to come up with an equation that would relate those two angles together. We're adding complication. Uh, instead, is there a way that we could come up with an uh, equation that includes theta, not theta 2, in it for this second S2? And I probably wouldn't have asked if there wasn't a way. So <laughs> the way is, it, what, do we know the length of this? Well, obviously, the length is changing as the piston moves. But it's always going to be related to the point 2 and the theta. Wouldn't the length of that side be uh, 0 0.2 times the sine of theta? Sure. Well, now we, have, we know two sides of the triangle. How do we get the third? Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so we could say S2 plus 0 0.2 sine theta is equal to 0 0.75 squared. Oh, I'm sorry. This is also squared. Forgetting my powers today. OK, so we got those two things squared. Is the, the two sides squared are equal to the hypotenuse squared. Uh, yeah. it's a more complicated equation. But because it only has a theta and an s2 in it, that's really going to help us so that we have a relationship between s and theta, which is what we're looking for. So go ahead and solve for s2. s2 is going to be equal to uh, 0 0.75 squared minus um, 0 0.2 sine of theta quantity squared uh, square rooted. OK, I want to give myself some more room by getting the description down here off. But i got to write down my givens. If you read the problem, crankshaft AB is rotating at a constant angular velocity of omega. So they give us omega. And right up here are givens. Omega is equal to uh, 150 radians per second. And we are also given that theta equals 30 degrees. And there we go. And what are we trying to find? The velocity of the piston. I'll just call that v. So now what we need to do is we know our s1 and we know our s2. We just need to put those together to make s. So we have one equation, and the only unknown is theta. And then we can take the derivative of it. So s is equal to 0 0.2 cosine theta plus the square root of 0.75 squared minus 
0 0.2 sine theta squared. We take the derivative of that and we get that v is going to be equal to, uh, we'll take the first term. We know it's equal to ds dt. And we want to remind ourselves of the chain rule. So we're going to write that that is the same thing as ds d theta times d theta dt to remind us of that d theta dt because it's easy to forget. Uh, the first term is just going to be the negative 0 0.2 sine of theta. Of course, then we have d theta dt, the chain rule. Okay. Second term is a little bit, uh, a little bit more challenging. I think I've got room here. First, we're just going to do the power of 1 half, and then everything underneath it to the negative 1 half. Okay, and then multiplied by that, we need to take the derivative of the inside. That first part is constant, so that would be 0. Second part, we'll do the power first. We got negative 2 times 0 0.2 sine theta to the 1. Now we need to take the derivative of the inside, the 0 0.2 sine theta, which would be 0 0.2 cosine theta. Then we need to take the derivative of theta, which is d theta dt. Okay, I think we've got all of the terms. Now we just need to clean it up and we can plug in the givens. I'm just going to give myself a little bit more room and then we'll go ahead and clean it up. Okay, you know a lot of this is just record keeping and practice, uh, making sure that you have all the components. I just rewrote the equation that we had and now we're going to clean it up a little bit. We know d, d theta dt is omega, so v is going to be equal to negative 0 0.2 omega sine theta. Uh, this one we have um, a 2 on the bottom, a 2 on the top, those will cancel out. Uh, if we look at our negatives, it looks like we have uh, two negatives, and so that will end up being positive. And on the top we have this term over here, which we have two point twos, so it's going to be 0 0.04. 0 0.04 and we have a sine theta cosine theta and an omega Okay, I actually found a small mistake that I made uh, when I brought down the power uh, of uh, cosine, 0 0.2 sine theta squared. And for some reason, I made it negative. That should have been positive. So this is actually a positive here. Let's leave this just with one negative, and this whole top part is negative then. Okay, so you know we all make mistakes. So we've got two negative terms. And now all we need to do is plug in what we have. We're going to plug in 30 for theta, we're going to plug in 150 for our omega, and we're going to come up with our answer. Okay, this first part ends up being negative 50, and the second part is minus 3.49, and everything um, is in feet. So we end up with negative 18.49, or approximately negative 18.5 feet per second. Okay, so what does that mean? We always have to interpret our answers and understand what they mean. So negative, well, how do we know what a negative means? It's because at the beginning of the problem we set up our coordinate system. Remember our coordinate system is the datum. Our arrow always goes from the datum to the object. You can see I put a nice big arrowhead on this. Make sure you're using your arrowheads. That arrowhead tells me what positive means. Positive means moving this way. Of course, we got a negative, so it means the piston is moving 18.5 feet per second to the left, and we've answered that problem. Hopefully this was helpful. Let me know if you have any questions.